midwinter, Christchurch and it's high water. If I wanted to come in here with a sensibly drafted boat of perhaps four foot or less, I would be fine right now. I could just drive in through the entrance at Muddiford and come on up to the quay at Christchurch. What a beautiful place. But if you came here at low water, it would be a very different story. If you want to come to Christchurch, the only way you're going to be able to do it is by planning your passage very carefully. You probably want a bit of favourable tidal stream to bring you here from wherever you're coming. So that'll have to be factored in, especially if you're coming out of the Solent with the ebb in the needles. But you don't want to arrive there too late because all this lovely water will have gone. So all that has to be thought out. So that really is what passage planning is about and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. It's interesting that um, when I was a young sailor, nobody I was self-taught you see, and nobody told me that there was such a thing as passage planning. I just sort of did it anyway because I very rapidly learnt that the only way to get somewhere was with, with the tide under me, sweeping me along. And that when I arrived, if there wasn't enough tide to float me in, it wasn't much good. I also needed to know lots of other things like, where was I going to dive in if the weather turned to the bad? What was the weather going to be? And was it going to bring me back the next day? All these things I used to think about. But until I started teaching sailing back in, oh, I suppose, about 1978, I never knew it was a subject all to itself but I rapidly learned, and it's the absolute bedrock of a good passage, is to plan it properly from the beginning. Today, we're gonna to plan a passage from the Hamble River to Chichester Harbour, and we're gonna pop into Sparks Marina, just inside the entrance there. So we need to know what's going on. Well, here we are, back in the study jolly cold on the water so it's nice to be in the warm at last. I've got a nice clean chart on the table here to talk about passage planning and I've got more charts in the chart pack. I've got my trusty 2B pencil, I've got my notepad, I've got a pair of dividers and I've got a chart plotter. That's really all I need. I'm just going to have a few words before we start planning a particular passage about passage planning in general and I've got here a little crib sheet. This is essentially what you need and what you have to do when you're planning a passage. It's interesting that the MCA now insists that everybody who's going from one place to another plans the passage. If it's a long passage and especially if it's a professional yacht, it's very sensible to write something down just in case anything happens and they want to know what you've been up to. If you're planning a passage for your private yacht and it's just a quick trip, I don't think you need to write everything down. You might choose to do so. It might make you more confident. And if you want to do that, brilliant, good for you. But if it's passage you make frequently, you still have to plan it, but it'll probably be all be up here. And you'll be able to tell somebody if they ask you. So that's the main thing. So here's the passage planning checklist. First off, charts. Now then, I think you want paper charts for this job. It's all very nice having a bulkhead plotter, but all the zooming and panning that has to go on causes all sorts of problems, quite honestly. And a paper chart, you can see straight away what it is. We'll talk about that in a minute. So you've got to have charts. You need a chart for the passage, a chart for the beginning and a chart for the end. And if there are any details on the way, it's nice to have a paper chart for that as well. If you haven't got them all, but you've got an overview paper chart and something to get you in and out, you can probably manage with your plotter. Next thing to do is look at the distances involved. See how far it is to where you want to go. Can you do it in one tide or do you need more than one tide? Have a look at the weather. At some stage you need to look at the weather forecast. The likelihood is you've looked at that beforehand and decided that you want to do the trip anyway. But do make sure that you've got not only the weather for the day of the passage but perhaps if you're going to one place and you're going to stay overnight and moving on the next day or perhaps coming home again make sure you know what's going to happen tomorrow or even the next day because there's one thing having a lovely sail down somewhere but if you're going to get caught out down the tube you don't want that so think about the next day as well and make sure you've got the forecast tidal streams absolutely vital to get this one right you if you don't get the tidal streams right you might as well stay at home if you if you're in home waters tidal stream of two knots with you if you're doing four knots means you're doing six knots over the ground if it's against you you're doing two knots over the ground so look at it like that you know make it work for you so we look that up in the almanacs and make sure we've got it right or as right as we can are there any tidal height issues that's a nice question very often there aren't 
But if the tide's going up and down and the harbour dries, or maybe it leaves a very shallow bar, then you need to know. And you've got to look that up as well and do it before you start. The last thing you want to be doing is scratching around trying to work out a tidal light when you're on passage. You might be able to get it off the plotter if you've got one, and that's great because for rough work, the plotter's fine. But don't rely on it for anything if it's going to be a fine judgment because I've got three plotters and they all give different answers. If it really matters, I work it out on paper. Then we plan a straight line route, see where we're going to go, see if there are any dangers along the way. Um, if I'm on a long passage and I'm passaging along the coast, I want to have a look at some alternative destinations. There's all sorts of good reasons for this. You might find when you're going along, God, oh, this is taking a long time, I'm getting fed up. Well, maybe the baby's crying. Maybe the weather's taking a nasty turn for the worse and you've had enough of it and you want to get out of it. Well, it helps a lot if you've planned any alternative destinations as you're going along. You know for a fact that you can get into this place at this state of tide that it's not going to be a problem. Have that up your sleeve as well. Plot some waypoints if we want to do that. I plot my waypoints on the paper chart so I can see what's what. I generally don't bother to put them on the plotter. That might sound like heresy. But actually, if you've got a plotter up and running, you can see what's going on. You can see where the boat is. If you've got your projected track running, which you should have, it'll put an arrow to where you're going next. And if perhaps you're going to one of the forts at the east side of the Solent, the arrow will be going there. You can see if it's crossing any dangers. What do you want a waypoint for? I don't know. But it's good to put them on the paper chart because that's a reminder of what's going on. If you like to put them on the plotter and break off the distance as you're going, perfectly all right. No quarrel with that at all. Just do it. Next up is the pilot book. This is really critical if you're going into a place where you've never been before. The chart's all very well, but really the pilot book just puts flesh on the bones. It gives you all that you need to know. So have a look at the pilot book and see what it says. You might be able to get away with using an almanac and some of the modern almanacs, so I'm using the cruising almanac here at the moment. <laughs> very good publication, so is Reed's, but uh, you can't really beat a pilot book when the push comes to shove. So have a look at what the pilot book says and while you're doing it prepare a pilotage plan for where you're going. You don't want to be scrabbling around with that at the last minute either. So long as you know what it's going to look like you might want to make notes about that. Sometimes I do or sometimes I just go in with the chart in front of me but whatever it is make sure you're ready and you're prepared. If you've got all that in hand and you can tell the MCA that's very nice. But what you really want it for is for your own satisfaction and to make sure that with a good passage plan you have a nice passage. Now let's have a look at a real passage. We're going to go from the Hamble River to Sparks Marina just inside Chichester Harbour. It's an interesting one. Short but full of action. It's worth noting that um, wherever you're leaving from in the Hamble River, it's worth filling your tanks before you go. Make sure your water tank's full. You'll be fine if you're going to Sparks, but you might decide you want to anchor in Chichester instead. And it'd be lovely to have, have a shower and a nice big wash up or something in the morning after your bacon and egg breakfast. So make sure your water tanks are full and particularly fill your diesel tanks because Port Hamble's got a really good fuel berth. Everybody uses it in the Hamble River and it's a cracker. Now then, I'm using an Imray chart pack of the Solent for this job because we're within the Solent boundaries and I find uh, I'm navigating very often primarily on passage. I'm using my plotter but I absolutely want a paper chart out there so I can have a look at the overview and see what's really going on. Um, <clears throat> also the final arbiter has got to be an up-to-date paper chart so uh, I, I like the Imray deal here because um, I've got a whole chart pack, I've got the whole lot, they're ring bound and it's not difficult for me to get from this passage chart to the detail chart at both ends, which I want and also actually I've got detailed charts all the way if I want to use them. So, <clears throat> so for me that's the choice of chart. If you've got Admiralty charts that's lovely. Um, they're quite expensive but they're very very clear but you need quite a few of them for this trip so uh, <clears throat> this is a good solution. First thing I'm going to look at, here's the Hamble. I'm going to come out this way, down towards, well there's a boy here, that's going to be Colshot boy. Then I'm going to proceed out down what looks like good deep water here, down the north channel, past this boy, on down past Gilkicker Point, and then I've got to negotiate the entrance to Portsmouth Harbour. It looks as though I've got two choices here. I can either go through this gap, or I can go round Horse Sand Fort. 
Well, for the moment, I'm going to plan on going around Horse Sand Fort because that gives me a straight shot down to Chichester, possibly passing outside this boy here, which I've already put a ring round because I'm interested in it. Next thing to know is how far is it? Can I do it in one tide? Well, let's have a look. Um, it's a fair way. I'm going to set my dividers up to, uh, to do three miles. There we are. That would be a good start. And I'm going to start measuring from Hamble Point. Uh, or Hamble Spit Boy, we used to call it. So here we go. Three, six, nine. It's, well, just about 11 miles to Horse Sand Fort. From Horse Sand Fort to what we call West Pole, which is on the bar at Chichester, is, well, about another five miles. So we're looking at 16, 17 miles, something like that. So... How fast are we going to be going? Well, that depends what we're driving, doesn't it? If we're in a motorboat and we're doing eight knots or maybe 18, that won't take you so long. If you're in a little sailing boat doing four knots, it's going to take you four hours. So, <clears throat> little sailing boat's going to be very interested in what the tide's doing. Motorboat will be slightly less interested, but whoever you are, it's going to make a difference. So, let's have a look and see what the tide's going to be doing and decide what time we might leave in order to get a good crack out of the tide. First off, we need to look at the Tidal Stream Atlas. So, here we go. It's in my cruising almanac here. At the back, if you're using Reed's almanac, you'll find it in the vicinity of the area that you're interested in. So, I want to see first what time the tide starts going my way. And I see straight away that these tidal stream pages with their little arrows that show me what's happening are relating to high water Portsmouth. So before I go any further, I'm going to have a look at what time high water Portsmouth is and I'm going to get it written down. So here we have Portsmouth. Today is the 22nd of January. So I'm going to make it today. Bit of a chilly day to be making a passage, but that's it. So I'm going to put a little ring round it so I don't lose it. But we're going to write it down. We're going to say low water Portsmouth is at 11.28 and the height is 2 metres. High water Portsmouth, HWP, is at 16.13 and it's 3.6 metres. That means the range, this is important, is 1.6 metres because... The reason why I'm interested in that is because the Tidal Stream Atlas is giving me two different rates for what speed the tide's doing. It's giving me 0.8 and 1.7. It actually says 08 and 17, but we all know that that means 0.8 and 1.7. 0.8 is the neat rate, 1.7 is the spring rate. So let's have a look and see what we've got. If we turn over to the Portsmouth page which shows us the Portsmouth tidal graph, we see that the neap range for Portsmouth for mean neaps is 1.9 metres. Well, we've got 1.6, so we've got a very small tide today. It's actually slightly less than neaps. So if we look at the rate, we'll be able to see that the tide is going to be going slightly slower than that, and that's really, for planning purposes, all we need to know. So, <clears throat> when does it start going our way? That's very interesting. Four hours after high water Portsmouth, it actually starts going east. It's coming down Southampton Waterlook and it's running along the north shore of the Solent and it's going east, so that's what we need. So that's four hours after high water Portsmouth, five hours after it's going our way, six hours after, five hours before high water it's still going our way and it carries on going our way and it's going our way until two hours before high water Portsmouth, in which case it slows down. So, we could say we want to be the three hours before high water Portsmouth. We'll have a look at the tidal height in a minute, but three hours before high water Portsmouth, what time is that going to be? 13.13. And we want to allow, what did we say? Well, let's say we're in a five, six knot boat. We want to allow three hours for the passage. So, 13.13, end of east going. So we probably want to leave at about quarter past ten at Humble Point. And we'll leave the marina at 09.45. Good. So that's our time sorted out. Now there's something else. We've, we're looking at the tides here. We've just got to look at a tidal height situation because there's a bar at Chichester and the bar can be quite shallow. So we need to be absolutely sure that we're OK. The entrance channel to Sparks Marina, I can tell you because I've already had a look in my pilot book, is two metres dredged. 
So I don't think we're going to have a problem there because uh, low water today, even if we were there at low water, we're going to have two metres of tide up. So there's going to be plenty of water to get in there, no problem. There nearly always is, it's not an issue. But Chichester Bar is interesting. So we'll have a look and see how much water is on Chichester Bar. And for that, we need to look at the pilot book. This is the Shell Channel pilot, which has got the whole of England and France in it. And it's, uh, I write it myself actually, so I'm uh, quite pleased with this. So here we go, Chichester Harbour, We've got a big page here showing Chichester Bar, but let's see what it actually says, because this is the best thing. Depths. Chichester Bar, like many others on this coast from here on eastwards, is subject to shoaling and general change as shingle shifts. Charts should therefore be read with caution and a sensible margin of safety applied. Well, that's really good advice, isn't it? Tide gauge on the West Pole Beacon gives heights of tide, not depths on the bar. So that, again, is quite understandable when you realise that the actual depth on the bar is going to change. Now, it says here that the bar is dredged every five years or so to 1.5 metres. Um, that's what we need to know, because what it means is today, at low water, there's going to be 3.5 metres of water. Now, the weather forecast is giving us southwesterlies about force 3 to 4. So that's not going to kick up much of a sea. So three and a half metres on the bar is going to be absolutely fine. And remember that it's a rising tide anyway. The tide's coming up because we're going to be there in the early or middle afternoon and high water's not till about quarter past four. I've also had a look at the tidal heights for Chichester and see how they differ from Portsmouth. And the answer is very little. So for planning purposes, we can put the two together because we're not in any critical state of affairs here. We've got plenty of water. So that's good news. So away goes that one. And away goes, for the time being, the tidal streams. Well done, boys. Good information. Now, I'm going to have a good look at the passage itself now. I come out of the Hamble to Hamble Spit Boy, and then I need to know what's going to happen next. Well, I'm going to have to come down towards this boy here. There's a detailed chart in here, which I've had a look at. It's OK to come from Hamble Spit Boy direct down to this one, which is called Colshot. So I'm going to put a waypoint just north of Colshot Boy. From there, if I have a look on my straight edge, I see that if I steer straight from Colshot Boy to a point just outside Horse Sand Fort, it'll probably clear all dangers, but it's taking me quite close to this shallow water here, which is going to be all right because there's going to be, well, it says one metre, there's going to be three metres on it, but it's, it's, well, there's no need for it really. I think if we come down towards this North Channel Boy here and put another waypoint here or hereabouts, that will keep us clear of that. We're in deep water all the way. And from there, we're going to go down to the vicinity of Horse Sand Fort. Again, this is well worth a waypoint at Horse Sand Fort. And I'm not putting it on the fort, you'll notice. I'm putting it just south of the fort because that's probably where we'll go. I'm going to have a look at a detailed chart now before I go any further because that will show me if I can go through this gap here, it may well be that when I've come round Gilkicker Point, I'll save a little bit of distance by going through there. I'm not sure that it's really going to be worth it, but just for the sake of it, we'll have a look at the detailed chart, because as it happens, that's also the chart for Chichester Harbour entrance. Here's the wonder of the chart kit. It's just great that you can just go straight over the page and Here's all the detail you want. Lovely chart, this one. Now, we can see here Horse Sand Fort, and we've put our waypoint just to the south of this. Absolute accuracy is not important, so long as it's just south of Horse Sand Fort, that's all we need to know. Now, from there, with the plotter, we can see that we could, if we wanted, steer a straight course for just south of West Pole. That would be nice, because that would take us past the winner boy, where I'll put another waypoint. The winner boy is south of some shoals here, which aren't going to be a problem today, because remember, we've got uh, probably three metres of water up by now to add to the charted depth of 1.8 if we end up going across there. On the chart here, we've got submarine barrier, passage only where indicated, it says. Well, yeah, nobody really tells you 
how deep this barrier is. It goes back to World War II. It's an amazing thing. They had a they had a barrier here that no submarine could get through. There's another one on the Isle of Wight side. And between the two forts, well, that was a passage, but they could police that and see what was going on. But this, nobody could get through there. Otherwise, the e-boats might have been able to get through, but with that there, they couldn't. So that sorted that out. We can pass through. There's a passage here, which I've used many times. Especially if you're going to Langston Harbour, it would be really useful. But coming in from where we're coming through, we have to go through there. Then we have to make a major course alteration to get down towards Winner here, because we don't really want to get involved with the tail of the East Winner Shoal. This is another of these sandbanks and shingle, and you can't be absolutely sure that it's going to be where it says it is. So um, give it a good clearance. Let's come round Horse Sand Fort, round the Winner Boy, and on to West Pole. That's decision made. We've got our waypoints on, and we can see what's what. We can see here, looking at the detail on the chart, that if we proceed from West Pole straight down to Chichester Bar Beacon, then we'll be in deep water all the way. We mustn't allow ourselves to be set down to the west because there's a drying patch here that we don't want to get involved with. There's another one over there, so we need to watch what we're doing here. And it might be worth making a note on your pad about that. Don't get set sideways when you're coming across the bar at Chichester. It's not difficult to allow that to happen. You don't need any fancy instruments or a plotter. All you've got to do when you're at West Pole is eyeball the bar beacon from West Pole. And you can't miss that if you line that up with something on its background, perhaps the entrance to the harbour there, you'll be able to see that, then you're absolutely bulletproof. You know that you are on that line out here, and you know you're on it all the way. You don't need a plotter. It's absolutely safe. So in through the entrance, as the pilot book tells us, it gets very deep as you come into the entrance, and even with a neap tide, you'll find the tides whistling in here, and then we get to the pilotage for Sparks Marina. You can see that it's right inside the entrance here, so we'd better have a look and see what the pilot book says about that, because there isn't a great deal of detail. We've got a blow-up on the chart over here, very helpful, but actually what the boys are... We'll have a look at the pilot book, see what it says. I've downloaded the latest entrance chart here for Sparks from Sparks' website, so I know exactly that I've got it right and bang up to date. And it says that uh, Sparks Yacht Harbour with all the facilities of an active yacht yard, lies immediately west of Black Point, the home of the Hailing Island Sailing Club. Um, that's going to be here, at the end of its own dredge channel. Enter the marked channels as soon as you pass the end of Hailing Island Sailing Club jetty. You can just see that there, look with a little light on it, leaving an East Cardinal beacon with a tide gauge to starboard. That's right, so we come round here and pass in between these two. A leading line of 277 is established with a pair of day-glow orange beacons for three cables or so. Well, it doesn't show those here, but they're going to be up here. So we know if we're steering 277, we should see the day-glow beacons ahead. It's always worth checking the compass bearing of a, of a transit, and don't just assume you've got it right, because if you're on those beacons, your compass should be reading about 277 true. There's not much difference between true and magnetic at the moment, so it won't be far away. And then you know you've got the right one. Um, it tells us here that you're going to come down here past some moorings on a pontoon, and that when you get to the end of the pontoon, there are some red-topped beacons which lead into the marina, and that inside the marina there's 2.5 metres on the berths at Mean Low Water Springs. So that's going to be heaps for us today. And essentially, that's our passage planned. Because it's a short passage, I don't really think it's worth pre-planning where you're going to go if you don't enjoy yourself or you're not liking it. I mean, there's always Portsmouth Harbour you could duck into. Uh, and you'd really want to plan that. If you've never been in there before, there's a lot to do. The important thing really was to decide to go round Horse Sand Fort rather than through that gap. That was a good piece of planning to decide on that and I think it was a good decision. So the whole thing looks pretty good really. If you're in a motorboat, straight there. If you're in a sailing boat with a leading wind like we've got today, same thing. You might as well be driving a motorboat. Hoist the sails off Humble Point, get yourself down there. Lovely. Coming back you might have to beat to windward and that's a whole other story. So you'll need to use the chart a lot more creatively then. You'll find your plotter useful too, but keep that paper chart handy so that you can look at the big picture without having to zoom out and lose all the detail. I think that's about it. If we stick with that, we'll not go far wrong. 